Welcome to the Crownsman Podcast, Episode 11, Drilling Technology in Mining and Oil and Gas. I'm your host, Jared Downey, and this is Gaudi Molina. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like uh, there was a more dramatic punch than we needed. We'll try it again. <laughs> this is Gaudi Molina. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I am good. I am excited, actually. Why? Because um, I think this is the, f- no, I, w- I don't want to say first, but it's the, it's the first, I guess. First, uh, are you, are you referring s- to that it's our first show, like our full show in the studio? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's our first full mm-hmm. podcast in the studio since we were at CIM. Yeah, because all the other episodes that we've done have been uh, cut, cut, yeah, we filmed here and then cut them in and cut it together. This exactly. is, we're doing the whole, we got a guest coming in. Yeah. We have, Rory's here. Yes, Rory's Rory Bamford here. is in the building. We always talk about him on the show. And, but he's rarely ever seen, so it, it's kind of nice that uh, yeah, he's he'll coming be out. Yeah, he's coming out of the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know what's funny? W- w- I think we mention him a lot um, live, uh, but he has been on he has our been. other podcast. Yeah, because the cut, too. Yeah. Um, for people that have not uh, watched this show before, we should tell you a little bit about why we're here and mm-hmm. what, we're, what we're doing. This is a sh- an industrial show. We cover... I'm going to let you do it. What do we cover today? <laughs> is it because you always forget? I always forget all <laughs> six, yeah. We, <laughs> we cover agriculture, forestry, mining, construction, transportation, oil and gas. Bam. There you go. Um, <laughs> and what we do is we bring in guests uh, to talk about their companies, about the industries, about their challenges. Um, we look for companies who are leaders in their industry, uh, people who drive innovation, um, I've actually got some things written. I want to. I want to read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, accelerate technology, build new projects, keep employees safer, and make our economy stronger. And so we are going to cover as we develop the show everything from the technology that they use uh, to the safety measures that companies are putting in place. So it's going to cover very broad, and that's what we do on the show. So we pick a something like mining. We either look at the technology or we look at developing new projects that are coming out. Um, the show has been getting quite good feedback, and we're very we're very happy with it. Hence, why we're on episode eleven. Yes. Um, we did it as a little test, and we realized people there was a demand for it. People wanted to know more about industry. You know, they don't want to just watch a two-minute clip and, oh, there's drilling happening. Not just that, but a lot of people also want to be part of the show mm-hmm. and, and tell their side of, of the story or their information, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And a lot of companies don't get a chance to sit down and really mm-hmm. dig into what they do. So a lot of people might even know the brand, but they don't really know. Like yeah. uh, when Bombardier came on, a lot of people don't know the, how heavy Bombardier is in transportation, that they're doing exactly. rail systems for underground mines. Yeah. People exactly. don't know that. Um, Energold is joining the show. Um, let me just find this here. So it's so Energold is I, I, the Energold Group. So they're a drilling company in mining, oil and gas. Um, they also do um, they do uh, what, like like wa- uh, I forget what it is. Like let me just find it here. I'm losing my spot, but that's okay. Give me one second. They do the horizontal drilling. You will have to bear with me. This show sometimes does go o- off script, <laughs> and especially when I'm on it. Uh, I wanted to see. They've got. There's three kinds of drilling that they do, and I can't. They do the energy. They do the mineral, and they. But they also do. Um, it's like drilling for well for for water systems for municipalities and things like that. Okay, so yeah. so we'll ask Fred. So we'll ask Fred a little bit more about that. Fred Davison is the guest. He's the CEO of Energold. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to be joining the show to talk about their company, what they do, some of the technology they they have developed. Um, so that's going to be an interesting show. Uh, audience feedbacks. I'm really, I'm really losing it today. <laughs> well, no, you know what? Audience feed- feedback is always great. We ask all the time. Uh, we love that you guys get back to us, and I'm glad that we, you did. 
you guys did, yep. and we'd love to uh, to kind of share. Well, a couple of our top two are. Um, one was from Malcolm, and I'm obviously not going to say full names. Don't want to embarrass anybody, but <laughs> um, he he gave a comment that I I, I did want to read on the air because it does um, it it brings up something that that I've thought about, and it was good to hear someone else who's watching the show that it's coming to their mind. Um, he he made a comment that all of, uh, this these info from Meg's reports and, and now shows uh, are great for getting the info out. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the problem is that it's always sort of the same information reports that they're putting out. It it's not that he he felt it wouldn't convince. And I'll read it word for word. Will uh, repeating the same facts over and over will not convince those who are against new minds and development, new mind development, and keeping existing minds open. Not really sure how we miners get past that. And that's a good question. Um, my answer to that is I think we need to dig in and, and do take the time to uh, highlight very specific things so that people start to gain more understanding of it. Um, there's a thing that even in, this is a little bit of a offshoot, but you there's things like in, in sports where they you make stars for sports teams and mm-hmm. then people get involved in it. When you highlight and get people start to become more comfortable and they get to know certain players in the industry, they, they'll they start to follow them, they'll start to engage, start to understand, and of course that raises the comfort level. Mm-hmm. Um, there's people that literally have in their mind that people go in a drill and they smash all, through all the trees and destroy all the vegeta- vegetation, and it's just not true. Um, yeah. But if you never really got a chance to listen to anything or dig in to a company like Entergold, how would you know? Exactly. Um, another one uh, we got was from Sam. Uh, his feedback was, you might expand to aerospace, co- aerospace companies somewhere in the Toronto area, interesting in mining other planets, moons, Mars, etc. That's pretty interesting. Sam, we will be covering that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. I'm... Uh, that's going to be a whole. Se- we're going to make a segment about it. <laughs> so then we we need we should add another another one to the wall. <laughs> mm. Spaceship to the wall yeah. with a big drill on it. <laughs> um, going to give uh, Fred is going to come in from Entergold and he'll give a lot of information that's going to be very helpful. But uh, we'll give you just a, a snapshot of uh, what they do. So we're going to go energy drilling. I'm just going to read this off. Uh, drilling is a process whereby a hole is bored using a drill bit to create a well for oil and natural gas production. There are various kinds of oil wells with different fu- functions. So there's exploration wells for finding oil, appraisal wells for studying feasibility um, and assessing the characteristics of, of the petroleum that they're trying to extract. There's development or production. These are the drills that are actually... Pump uh, the, that are pumping it out. Mm-hmm. So these are all t- different types of wells that need to get drilled. Relief well wells um, uh, for when there's uh, an emergency, when there's a blowout. So they um, they're like a backup system. There's an injection well. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to be honest. I try and I don't really understand. I know that it's for injecting something into th- into the well to keep levels balanced so that the the oil can be extracted properly. But um, that's about as much as I know. <laughs> is drilled to enable pet- an injection well is drilled to enable petroleum engineers to inject steam, carbon dioxide, and other substances into an oil producing unit so as to maintain reservoir pressure or to lower the viscosity of the oil, allowing it to flow into a nearby well. There you go. Um, <laughs> they also do a lot of mineral. Uh, Intergold does a lot of mineral uh, drilling. Yeah. drilling. This is primarily an exploration uh, diamond drill. Um, diamond drills are used to probe the contents of known ore deposits or potential sites. The thing with a diamond drill is um, what's unique about it is it, it drills down and then, so it might drill out. 200 meters down into the ground but then it extracts a core sample i don't know if you've ever if you've ever seen anything about mineral drilling you'll see that they have these boxes and they have all these samples then they get tested to see what is in what rare minerals are or are not in them um Entergold has about 240 drills 
120 of these are these drilling rings for for the mineral dr drilling. Um, I'm just going to read off read off a list: highly portable diamond drilling rigs, uh, a deep hole rig, highly mobile underground drilling rigs, reserve circulation rigs or RC drills. Um, those are interesting. Uh, they're they're similar to an air core drill. Um, that I mean, I'm just it's not going as smooth to me for me today. <laughs> not gonna lie. <laughs> That's okay, you know, because um, uh, our guest will be able to kind of answer all these questions. Yeah. And we will be able to go further deep into all the different drills mm -hmm. that they do have um, and what, they're, what they do, how mm -hmm. they work, and how that um, works out in the industry. Yeah, and um, basically what I, wa what I want to touch on with the reserve circulation drill is they do the deep drilling. So they go up to like 500 meters down. That's what they're commonly used wow. for. And they're, they're big structures. So if you ever have a, a, when you get a chance, go on to Google and look up the reverse, reverse circulation rigs. Uh, they're quite something. Mm -hmm. um, th and then they also have reverse air blast rigs. Um, I'm going to just touch on this one quickly, the horizontal directional drilling. HDD. HDD. <laughs> um, what these are used to install, uh, install like telecommunications and power cables, conduits, water lines, sewer lines, gas lines. Um, they're used for crossing waterways, roadways, uh, shore approaches, congested mm -hmm. areas, and the big one, environmentally sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. So they also provide those drills um, and do, well, provide that drilling service. Um, very interesting. Uh, and again, if you want to if you want to look at them up, go horizontal directional drilling. Look up some of the graphs and how they do it. It's it's quite something. Uh, Hydrovac trucks. I'm going to ask him about that because I I don't. This is um. It's it got here. They used to soft expose underground utilities. I I honestly don't know what these are used used for in detail. So I'm going to ask him about those as well. Mm -hmm. And um. They also manufacture water rigs, mineral rigs, multi-purpose rigs, parts, and tooling. So we're going to talk oh. to Fred about that. So they do a lot. Um, they've grown very fast. They've acquired companies. We're going to talk a little bit about their acquisitions, um, about their the units that they have on site, some of the projects they've done. It's going to be an interesting interview, and they're going to we're going to have them on in about two minutes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick uh, quick break uh, to talk a little bit about our sponsor. Yeah. I'll leave um, that to you, Gowdy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, our sponsor, Cat Footwear. Uh, we're also giving away two pairs of uh, boots, uh, both men and women. The first are the men's, which are just behind me here, the Excavator XL. Um, they're, also, they're waterproof, composite toe, insulated, slip resistant, puncture resistant. Uh, the second pair are the women's, um, just back here, and those are the Drivers Waterproof Steel Toe. Um, and those are being given away if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> um, at Crownsman P. Um, also, Cat Footwear is giving out 20% off mm. their uh, purchases online mm -hmm. with promo code CRWCAT at checkout. So if you don't win, you can still get 20% off a pair of really, really comfortable boots. <laughs> yeah. And we only have, we have to give away the size 9s and the size 7s. That's right. So if we don't have your size, but you want the boots, I actually wore... Those the the men's boots. Um, I was on site for uh, for one of our uh, we do we do advisory work for you know marketing and things like that for companies. So I was on uh, site for a company called Savannah Equipment, and um, so I took their boots out and I wore them all day. They are pretty pretty comfortable. Yes, they are. So twenty percent promo code. We'll have the banner in the bottom. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Save twenty percent. You're eventually going to buy work boots. It's actually this show was going to get released at December in December, so right around Christmas time. So it'd be perfect. Yeah, it's a gift. Uh, you can if you can let Rory yes. know. Rory's going to come in and talk a little bit about uh, introduce Fred, and we are going to get underway with the interview. I said to keep it under ten minutes, and I did fifteen, so I'm fifty percent too slow. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, so Energold, I'm going to read off, uh, who Energold is as a company. 
Um, so you have a little idea as Rory's coming in. Entergold Drilling Corp is a diversified global drilling solutions provider serving mining, oil, gas, water, and geotechnical clients. Um, the When they founded, the company realized that the existing existing mineral drilling technologies um, and services available in the market were inadequate and therefore, and we're going to talk about this in the show, developed a new specialized drilling rig that was highly mobile and would leave a minimal environmental footprint in order to meet the challenges of that particular operating environment. They have um, 240 drills worldwide and they've done drilling projects in North America, South America, Africa, Asia, Central America, as well as the Caribbean. It's rainy outside. I would like to go to the Caribbean now. <laughs> and the Middle East. All right. And uh, we actually have Rory. Right, Rory. Please so step in. Yeah, uh, yeah that's absolutely. Easier. Please yeah. do. Um, as Rory's settling in, uh, I'm just going to read this. In growth, in the past four years, Entergold embarked on implementing its strategic goals to become a leading international uh, specialty driller, um, successfully completing three acquisitions. Uh, Enviro Drill Limited out of the UK, Dando International Limited, also out of the UK, and Bertram International Corp, expanding its international footprint and diversity in its service offerings. So they're a growing company, which makes it interesting. You're missing something. I am. There you go. Oh, thanks. Nope. <laughs> okay, oh, not, not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So we're going to turn up your volume there. How do you like our new studio? It's pretty. It's pretty. Pretty? It's pretty, pretty. <laughs> I lost my words. <laughs> no, it's nice. It's a yeah. really nice setup. It's a little, I was, when we first um, did the. Um, How am I the for set up here? I think you're good. Good. And welcome. Thanks. Sorry, Jared. Well, when we first were coming into the studio, because when we were at the show, there's so many people, there's a lot of action, so it's easier to have sort of the energy level up. But then I found actually here, there's not, there's also not distractions, so you get to focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit easier. A little bit Is easier. That yeah. As <laughs> doing the hosting? Other than today, I'm having a real <laughs> fun time today. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> It's okay. I think we all have our, our, our days. Yeah. I believe, you know what? It's the competition factor. Raymond tried, um, Raymond takes photos and helps with filming the show. And then he took your spot. He tried to take my spot, yeah. and that <laughs> bothered that me. Really <laughs> it really got to me. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, Raymond. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, so Fred, uh, Fred is here. Fred is here. And you. In the green room. Yeah, you've got to kind of hang out and yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. Got some. Yeah, the we should put a camera on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's actually it. a good idea for later on. You have like you can throw in some of the those pre clips. pre-show. Yeah, the pre-show. Yeah. So um, don't tell anybody though, because then the <laughs> conversation's way better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it will exactly. Yeah, you get to sit there and kind of meander through. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how did you? Did, were you aware of their company, or did you track them down? No, I tracked them down. I can't even remember where I found them. I saw them on a list. Somewhere I don't remember where that list was. So, but what I liked is that they are involved with mining and a lot of energy. And as he's saying, they're actually doing a lot with fiber optic now, and as well geothermal. Oh. So they're kind of they're going into all these different different areas where drilling is really needed. But I I liked it because we've done a lot of mining, so I wanted to. They're really pushing into the energy sector. Oh, okay. So I like that, that they're kind of a cr not a crossover. They have two different divisions. Like you said, with those acquisitions, mm -hmm. they've done four since the 1990s, I guess. So that kind of puts them in, and they actually operate using those subsidiaries' names because people know those companies oh, okay. by those names. Okay, oh, I'm going okay. to make uh, – did you have a chance to talk to him a, a, a little bit about those acquisitions? Yeah, the one – I can't remember the name. It starts with a B, and it's so you can ask him about that. Uh, Bertram. Bertram, yeah, and that's Kay. it. So yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll get into I'll get into that a little bit with him too, because that that's so they're actually operating using those same brands. They use it because people know them yeah. by those oh by those names. Okay. Well, this should be interesting. So, if you wouldn't mind, Rory, if you could go get I will go Mr. Grab Mr. Fred. Yep. And, and enjoy uh, the interview. Yeah, it'll be, be fun. fun. Yeah. Yay! Thanks, man. Good to have you back. We've the last two things we filled. You haven't been here. <laughs> so I'll just have him walk 
Yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's always it's funny because Rory ends up doing a lot of the pre-screening for the show. So I talked to Fred about a, a month a month ago, and then I met him for two minutes as he comes in, yeah. and then I got to sit down, and then we we yeah. have the conversation. Definitely, so the conversation out there is yeah. just much more relaxed. Um, yeah, that's you like you said. Feel, yeah, that's where the show should no be. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. Okay. Hello, yes, friend. Here we yes. Are. Our Please guest. have a seat here. We'll take a few minutes to uh, to okay. set you up. Just have yeah. yeah. So yeah, you'll need the headphone headphones on. Okay. And we're gonna have to scooch in a little. <laughs> yeah, you have to be. Nice and close. We'll get real friendly here. There yeah. You go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, can you, let's just have you introduce yourself. Okay. Just mic check. Oh, thank you. No, no problem. Fred Davidson, I'm the president and CEO of Vennergold uh, Drilling Corp, uh, no, otherwise known as Vennergold Group. Okay, Kay. perfect. How's our sound check? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and if, uh, you know, as we, we, we actually only met, um, I was just saying before you walked in on the show, we actually only met. Two minutes <laughs> before the show started, kind of thing. I'm gonna so be testing you on some of those questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we we don't we don't rush through through the conversation here. Um, we we want to kind of go through the questions and take our time and uh, get to know your company, get to know your outlook on the industry, and uh, you know we we've got the the questions that we went over about a month ago. Um, but if there's new talking points you want to go in, we, we've got time. Fair enough. All right. Um, let me just find. I heard, uh, on a separate note, I heard you uh, got sent to the wrong uh, location this morning. Well, you, you can never trust Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had, he missed the East, part, uh, the Columbia part, and went to East well, Columbia. The thing, well, the thing is, we've had, we keep having that happen because we don't send uh, the, we have to send people the postal code as well. Yeah. And if you don't put in the postal code, Google will not send them to this location. They're really? refusing. Yeah. So we yeah. keep getting people going, and then that. So most of the time, it's actually our fault because we forget to put the... I'm not blaming you on this one. <laughs> it's much more fun to blame Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he always blames me for yeah. everything. So. Yeah. He's, he's got big shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, um, your your background, where you... Did you found the company? Yeah, I did, actually. Uh, we were originally in the mining side. And uh, when in the mining side, we found that the traditional methods for doing exploration, drilling, uh, created a heck of a mess, uh, didn't do anything for the social or community. And the end result as an industry, we were tending to alienate rather than ingratiate ourselves with the, the local community. And as a result, uh, we started off oh, about, I guess around 17 years ago, uh, we picked up a small drill that we could move into a site without having to create roads. Mm -hmm. We could employ the locals to help us. Uh, and the program went really well. Uh, the locals were very supportive of us. We had minimal impact upon the environment. And especially when you're working in some of these communities, uh, you're the first salary they've ever earned in their life. Mm -hmm. And it was really appreciated. We recognized as a mining company that we're, the driller is the first impact he makes in the local community. Right. And if you make a mess, if you alienate the locals, the mining company's now got a huge hill to climb. So that initial drill would get down to about 75 meters. So it was it was pretty primitive. Uh, we've been upgrading those drills, ev basically evolving those drills now. And uh, we we call them modular. Everybody thinks of, we, if we say they're man portable, everybody sort of wonders what sort of thing you've got. They, they look like a bit of a sewing machine, but when you put them all together, and the whole idea is you bring in parts that are fairly light, so you have the local community move them in on their traditional trails, not of cat road. Uh, you pay the locals, so they become involved with the program, it becomes their program. And when you put that rig together, it can drill like any conventional drill. So we assemble it on site. Oh, so you're, you are packing it in, uh, in pieces then? Oh, yeah. Ah, and uh, we, we move it in with mules, we move it in with, uh, we've moved with dugout canoes. 
uh, you know, uh, we've moved it with people, just carrying it in. Helicopters, we've drilled from the Amazon to Papua New Guinea to the high Andes. They're very flexible because of their mobility, and yet they're very powerful rig, uh, case in point, rather than one big engine that w might weigh 1,000, 1,200 pounds, we'll have three small engines. Oh. Same horsepower, but you put them together. Oh, and okay. uh, the second thing we do is the, the drills are very simple. We've dumbed them down. <laughs> uh, as opposed to everybody else who's getting more fancy in their equipment. Mm -hmm. And when you're working in a remote location, the more you have on that rig, the more likely something's going to break. And ours are very robust machines. And the third part of it is uh, the skill set of a lot of our drillers isn't high. And traditionally in a big drill program, you have mechanics there and everything else. We don't. Mm -hmm. We basically just have spare parts. And because it's modular, if a part breaks, they pull it out, insert the new part, and continue on drilling. Oh, super so easy. So then do you, so from what you're saying, then you're doing a lot of the, where you're doing a lot of the initial. Yeah. Is that, is that primarily what your business is? Well, uh, that's how we started out. That's uh, how you started out. And what happens is you work with a client, you do a good job for them. Now they come in and they say, well, can you do something more for us? And sometimes these rigs will drill like a conventional rig. Uh, but sometimes when you get to certain depths, uh, there's, limitations time-wise on these rigs uh, that slow you down. So then we, we have bigger rigs, uh, and then some clients say, well, we like diamond drilling, which is a, a bit of, and some people wonder what diamond drilling is. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually been accused of drilling for blood diamonds. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it, it's a diamond-encrusted bit, uh, and as it cores down, it, it produces a core inside the, the rod. But that's time-consuming, more expensive, gives high detail, but uh, some clients will say, look, we, we want you to do, say, every fifth hole that way, but we want you to do RC, which is like a hammer down hole, and just blowing the chips up mm -hmm. uh, to give us oh. less, faster penetration, a lot less expensive. And the diamonds confirms the what they're reading, but the chips give them basic data. So we've expanded into that. And of course, uh, we've also expanded into uh, drilling in the oil sands, uh, drilling geothermal, geotechnical, and HDD. So w we see ourselves as a sort of global drilling solutions provider. You, you bring us your problem, we'll find a solution for it. Right. Okay. What? Um, so how did you like? Wh where did you get your start? You know, to end up here with a with a company, you know, this size, it's grown. I mean, you've you've had acquisitions. Wh where did it all? You know, well, I used to teach at UBC uh, in, oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in, really? in accounting, uh, <laughs> and a friend of mine uh, wanted to build him a mine up in northern British Columbia, and he needed a CFO, so I got involved with him there. Oh, and then we built a second mine, and then Total took us over, the French oil company, mm -hmm. and uh, we worked with them for a few years, and then Total left Canada again, like they do every 10 years. Uh, and then we ended up, uh, I was working with the Wheaton uh, group uh, with the Golden Bear Mine. Mm. And after that got sold off, uh, looking around, so let's do exploration. So, yeah, my, my background is uh, not exactly a geologist. I've got right. a BA, MBA, and a CA, but, uh, and about one third of the way through, trying to get a PhD. Uh, so it's it's been a lot of experience more than anything else. Right. So I guess when you were teaching at UBC, you weren't expecting to uh, to be running a drilling company. Not a really. Few years no. Later. <laughs> no. This was one of those things that you know they it walks across in front of you and you see it, and it's opportunistic. It's something you see that has a real rationale for being there. It it has value, and uh, I I think it's worked really well for us. It. When we first brought these rigs in and started working with them, the industry looked at us and said, well, again, it looks like a sewing machine. Uh, but it's now become a standard in the industry and uh, gets a little more competitive now. Mm -hmm. But the other side is we're constantly making improvements. It's an evolutionary thing, both for environmental safety and productivity. Right. Actually, we, you said when you first did it, they were 75, they were going 75 meters down. Yep. 
Now what are they, what can you go to? Well, the models we're using right now, we find about 1,000 meters. Uh, it starts to become fairly inefficient. 1,000 meters? Yeah. Yeah, it is. You know, visualize the uh, Toronto, uh, the CN Tower piled on top of itself a couple of times, and you're pushing something the size of this class that down that I was expecting about meters. 200 or 300. I wasn't expecting you to say 1,000 meters. No, no. There and is. that must depend on what type you're what you're drilling into, right? Or um, Generally, the more competent the rock, the easier it is. Uh, it, so it is, you're right. Uh, a lot of the things we run into isn't the rock itself. It's the, uh, the issues you run into going down. You run into sand structures that allows, that takes your water away. And you, we use water circulating to A, remove the fines from what you're cutting with the diamonds, and B, to cool a bit. Mm -hmm. And if you lose water, you can't remove the fines, now you have a problem. So we have to use additives that sort of plug those holes. And by the way, all of our additives are non-toxic. They're all tested. Uh, nothing that we use in terms of additives is environmentally unfriendly, contrary to the mythologies out there. Right, and well, that's that's a big goal yeah. of our, actually, yeah. before you walked in, we were, we were talking about that. One of the, f uh, the feedback that we got um, from our last shows, which was talking, our, our last show was about getting mines off the ground. So we had yep. a consultant come in and he, he provides some really good information. And one of the feedback we, or feedback we got from the audience um, was that there's so much information. It's the same sort of messaging out over and over in all the magazines and now the shows. And there's not, but how are we going to make uh, it so that people can learn and and actually will start to support some of these new projects and that. And I think a lot of it is the educational aspect. Um, mines get uh, maybe a 30-second clip on the news, and then it's gone. And usually it's when something goes wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and so uh, I think it's important to, to take that time to, to mention <laughs> those types of things. Um, because once people realize it, and they next time they see the drill rig coming into their community, they have a different feeling towards it because they understand it just a little bit better. I think we have to do our part, too. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is education. Part of it is there are some bad actors in the industry. The yeah. There's always some of those around. And, mm -hmm. and as you pointed out, uh, they're the ones that get highlighted. The fact that sort of 999 mines are operating professionally and with safety and conscious and one screws up, the one gets the press, right? Yeah. And and that's an ongoing problem. And the other problem is uh, open pits aren't very attractive. Let's face it; it's a big hole in the ground. Uh, but quite frankly, for the most part, those open pits uh, are reclaimed in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to be working more in towards uh, underground mining, so the area of disturbance is very negligible. Right. In fact, we've designed our rigs. Uh, uh, a model of our current rig to go underground and drill into very tight, small areas that allows uh, our clients to sort of avoid heavy uh, expenditure in terms of money and times testing. 99 out of 100 times, they, what they're testing isn't a mine. So right. you want to do it with minimal impact, lowest cost possible, and allow them to walk away at the appropriate time or to get the information that they want to stay there. Yeah. And keep on working. I, I'm I, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> actually, a question I did have about as well is um, the the steps that you're taking. Is is this? I mean, you've innovated some of these drills and now, and you you mentioned about competition. Are you seeing? Are you seeing that the process, the the drills getting taken apart and then get remanufactured on site? Are you seeing more and more companies do that now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely become one of the standards in the industry. Yeah, I mean, ten years ago, nobody would believe it. Uh, now it is a standard because people are conscious of the economics involved. They are conscious of the social impact. They are conscious of the environmental impact. And these drills are very productive. So the end result is, yeah, <laughs> I'll lose a driller or two, and he'll start his own little drilling company on the side. Right. And uh, and I, I applaud it in one sense because, quite frankly, it's something the industry has to adopt. It has mm -hmm. to lower the environmental impact. It has to make a more positive social impact where it's working. That's how we'll establish our credibility. There's no other way we'll do it. Right. And you said about, uh, so these drills, you're actually manufacturing these drills then? Yeah. And, yeah. and are you doing the, un you said that you developed the underground. Are you manufacturing the underground? Yep. 
Yeah. Yep, but for ourselves, not for other people. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That was my next question. Yeah, no, I don't want to. I don't want to tell them everything we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one of the the things that I, I know the audience find find interesting is challenging challenging markets, and y- you've worked across I think it was twenty twenty five countries. Yeah. Um, yep. What are some? You know, and I don't want you to pinpoint anybody out. You know, or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, um, well, actually, maybe I do, <laughs> but right. you don't <laughs> feel no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm wondering what are examples of some of the really challenging uh, environments, uh, n- to markets that you, you've had to try to enter? Uh, we're, we're facing a multiplicity uh, of, of issues, and it's getting more and more complex, Um there was a time you just move into a country type of thing. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, uh, the countries are very specific in what they want to see. Yeah. Uh, they want to see employment. In many cases, they want to see their own sort of heroes in the area do what the work that you're doing. And right. they may not be able to do it, but they insist on doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're running into increased regulation, uh, such as transfer pricing. There's this whole thing that the governments have said that, well, you're moving equipment into this country, uh, therefore you need to price it accordingly, fair market pricing, which I have to get an independent consultant to do for $20,000. Uh-huh. And then that's what they assess the importation duties on, et cetera, et cetera. Or you'll get another situation, transfer pricing, where we're shipping and supervising a project in another country, and uh, the our, in Canada, for instance, they'll say, okay, you have to add 10% on to every bill for the what effort you're putting in. The other country, will they'll say, well, you, you can only add 5% on. So all of a sudden, we're getting zinged for 5%, which we can't deduct anywhere else. Right. It, it, it's constant bureaucracy, I'd say, is the biggest issue we're facing. Environmental, not so much, because I think we have a high standard there. Uh, the other one is social communities, because a lot of the work that's done in the mining, the money ends up going to whatever federal government exists and never gets back to the local community. Mm -hmm. And they tend to resent that. And yet those taxes we pay, uh, whether it be a driller or the ultimate mine, are not cheap. They're Mm -hmm. not there. And yet the local community isn't seeing the benefit of it other than maybe direct employment. And they resent it and you run into social issues. So it's very much country by country. It's very much culture. Some countries are very aware of mining. They encourage it. Others uh, are trying to place their own heroes in that place, so you can't work in their country until they've taken every idea you've got. Uh, and, and other countries uh, are just prohibited because of the maybe the history they've had with mining, or mm-hmm. maybe just lack of knowledge of mining. Yeah, what is what is it like to go into a community? Um, I think when we we talked before, you you talk. I think it was the Dominican Republic that you were in, um, and. You came in with with your drill rigs and ended up hiring people to to, to pack in the drills mm-hmm. and get everything set up. What's what is that sort of that that from start to finish process for for recruiting the local community to do something like that? Actually, the Dominican Republic was the very place we did our first drilling. And, oh, and uh, with that seventy five meter rig, uh, and the local community was very poor. Uh, they were s- sitting on an area that was interesting from a geological point of view and a, and a geologist had identified it as a target. And uh, our, always our local managers are always local. They're, they're not a gringo imported into the country. Mm-hmm. So we, he went in, he explained the process, uh, and depending on the, the situation, you, you may have sort of the head man in the local village will help allocate the jobs out. Uh, in this case, it was sort of a family village, and mm. sort of granddad would sort of say, okay, you know, Jose, it's your turn to work this week. And we work with that. Now, the skill set varies. If somebody's carrying rods or carrying equipment, skill set's not very high. When they're working on the drill itself, not actually operating the drill, but working on the drill itself, there has to be a higher skill set, and we train. Mm-hmm. Uh, and eventually that investment we make in training works for us because that person ultimately will take and go work on another project in the Dominican Republic. As his skill gets better, 
he then becomes maybe an assistant driller and then a driller. Mm -hmm. And in a case like Mexico, um, we only have, uh, I'm using the word gringo, but that only applies actually theoretically to Americans, but only one North Americano uh, in all of Mexico. And we've got about uh, 350 people working there. So we evolve to the local community and we become, as far as the local community is concerned, we become a Dominican company or we become a Mexican company mm -hmm. and we manage within that scope as well. And I think that's a critical. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to bring value to the community and at the same time by doing that, you're also having them become part of the program. And that's how you address a lot of these stages where people don't do that they come in and pose themselves. We've got the right to drill, get out of our way. Mm -hmm. And a year later, uh, the drill's burnt and they're all chased out of the country. Right, yeah. So, yeah, you, you have to be very careful. And I, I, I guess from a government, even if you're working with a, a government that's difficult to work with, when all of a sudden they've got 350 in, uh, employees, there's a, there's a certain amount of pressure on the, on the government to work with you as well. Very definitely. Yeah. Very definitely. Uh, they... Uh, and we, we try and work with the government, obviously. Uh, they change rapidly, and, mm -hmm. and in some of these countries, they're not necessarily the best places to people to work with. But they're a reality. That's the country's culture, and yeah. we try and work within that culture. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, the, uh, I'm just going to find my place here so I make sure we... Um, next part is, is the industry. Uh, mineral prices. Um, I, I, I've invested a bit over, over the years, um, into the, into the mining yeah. industry and, um, following those prices, uh, actually one of my very first as we investments where we bought bars of gold, this is way back and, uh, and then, and silver. Yep. And then we, we watched it. So we got, we learned very quickly that things can Ca go can catch the falling. Knife. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, how does a company like Energold, who is is dependent on these 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 uh, exploration companies, actually, I'm going to take a step back t to clarify something. You are the contractor commonly for yeah. for the companies. So who who is the the company that's actually getting you to do the work? Generally, the mining company itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, when I say mining company, it can be an exploration company right. that doesn't have a mine. But generally, the mining company itself. So it's a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. Right. So how, a, as the 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 industry and, and prices are fluctuating, how does a, a company like Energold, um, you know, not not obviously not survive. just survive, <laughs> but also grow? I mean, the, yeah. you you've expanded. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's you haven't expanded in the easiest market. No, no, uh, and and it, it's interesting because yeah, in about 2011, 2012, we did about 120 million dollars doing minerals only. Mm. Uh, but at that time, we sort of sensed that the market was getting soft, and uh, we we did a couple of acquisitions. Uh, one of which was a company that works in the oil patch, uh, drilling the oil sands mines. And they're mine. So to us, it was no great evolution. But oil is responds differently than other commodities. Right. So that's kept us quite busy. I think our high for that was $50 million mm. with them. So uh, that held us up right there. Uh, at the same time, yeah, uh, minerals are highly volatile. And uh, you can't invest heavy money and count on every one out of every four years being great and three years being sort of slogging right so the other side we have is we saw that we have a talent talented crew we've got the equipment we've gone into some non-mineral work uh infrastructure work primarily yeah i was seeing that yeah and it's going nuts quite frankly uh where recently minerals have sort of softened a little bit again right <laughs> silver and gold uh, the uh, the non-mineral side uh, has been growing fairly substantially. In fact, we hit a low in, in I guess, uh, 2016 where nobody was drilling. Oil prices were at 30 bucks. Uh, all the minerals were down. Uh, we're now about, I guess, 45% over that. Uh, we, we're looking at hitting sort of in the area between, well, if you use our... our second quarter results as an indicator should do about 90 million dollars this year 
half of that will be non-minerals. Mm. Uh, energy will be one. And uh, it's it's growing this year. will probably be about a 50% increase over last year. Uh, we have clean energy. We do geothermal, right. uh, ground loop geothermal. That's very dramatically growing in, in the United States. Uh, it's starting to catch on in Canada, too. And uh, then we do other drilling for uh, infrastructure, such as geotechnical, for roads and bridges and what have you. And the other one we picked up about a year and a half ago was uh, HDD, or horizontal drilling, and it's not the oil patch drilling. Yeah, I want. Yeah, that's one of the things I actually yeah. wanted to ask you a little bit more about, because it's, it's kind of a new thing for me. Um, it is. It's, uh, and uh, what it's primarily designed is we have drill rigs that drill underneath rivers or uh, roads or what have you, and we s- install infrastructure, everything from water lines to the big one is fiber optics right now. Right, yeah. Uh, and we're finding that, A, that's a real growth industry, especially as everybody's switching over from copper to fiber optics. You don't want to tear up a road just to put a, a little thing this wide across the road. Uh, so we drill it. And uh, we've just completed a fairly large project in uh, Cal- Calgary and uh, south of Calgary. We've got a couple more coming out in uh, uh, Alberta because they're really moving into this. Uh, all of these uh, subdivisions that were previously copper wired, now they're going uh, mm-hmm. fiber optics. Uh, we're doing some work uh, in BC as well and pretty well through the, prov- uh, the uh, western provinces. Um, and interestingly enough, in Central America mm. where uh, they have uh, they've a massive been a massive construction in in Central America on buildings, and everything used to be above ground there, so it looks like a rat's nest when you drive through one of these major cities, and it's surrounded by buildings that are forty stories high, but a rat's nest of, of wires, and they're putting a lot of that underground, mm-hmm. and uh, we're finding we're quite busy there, and that's an expanding market for us as well. So. It's, uh, that plus the geotechnical work is, uh, it's still a very small part of what we do overall, but you're looking at margins that are running up in the 40 and 50 percentile. So right. it, it sort of brings up the averages from the mineral drilling, which is pretty tough right now. Yeah. And do these vary, do these kind of contracts, are they varying from, from government to private? And Yeah. 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 I mean, sometimes we'd be working for equivalent to say a TELUS. Right. And other times it'll be a government having their water lines installed in a uh, community. Right. Uh, so it depends who and what you're working for. Uh, generally, our contract is, though, with the contractor that takes on the whole project. Right. So we're not directly, say, dealing with TELUS itself. We're dealing with the contractor who's dealing with TELUS. And our job is to run those lines, uh, and then they do all the wiring and what have you after that. Right. Yeah. Um so it, when you're when you're looking uh, as a company, you know you've taken on some of these partners. How how much uh, these partners? How how, when, how recent is that? Um, these th- you've taken. I think what was I? I was finding. Well, you know them. The three companies that you've yeah. taken over. Um, um, has that been over? Has that been fairly recently, or has that kind of been over the life of uh, the company? 2011 was the uh, acquisition in the oil and gas. Uh, 2011, we also acquired a manufacturing company that manufactured drill rigs because we couldn't get drill rigs at the time. It was six and nine months delay. Uh, Unfortunately, again, uh, (laughs) with drill rigs, when everybody's no longer drilling, there's a lot of drill rigs out there. So things have been not brilliant on that side. But the other one we say most recently was two years ago, and that's this uh, horizontal drilling. And in all cases, we own 100%. Mm, it's okay. They're, they're, whole, they're subsidiaries of ours. We try and keep the previous management on because they know what they're doing. There's no sense in trying to reinvent the wheel. And we try and give them bonuses to encourage them to perform. And I think they're part of the team now. And uh, it allows us to be able to... We were ran into a proposal. It was over in Europe for one of our projects. And we were able to fly somebody out of Canada over there to show our guys how they could do the project and how they could bid the project and that. And having that skill set within the group is really working well for us. Yeah. When you, a company like yours, um, you, you talked about going over into Central America. Uh, is it, 
this is the, I, m the much smaller scale. But yep. I um, I used to have a little leaf trough company. So okay. a lot of a lot of our our work was, and this is I'm 19 years old with a little leaf trough truck, and we're climbing all over roofs. And most of our work would come from, um, probably 50 percent of it would come from the referral. Yep. People going to know the brand, or they'd see us across the street working, and and that's Walk that's across how we the street. Uh, across hey, the street, yeah. and we yeah. keep going. Yeah. yeah. So we'd always start early, so we had a few hours after to do the second job that we'd likely get. How much of your of your business I is like that? Um, is this you, a lot of it is bidding on uh, on contracts, or is it you, you've worked with these companies now for for ten years, so they keep using you? I mean, I'm sure it's a mixture, but sort of what would that mixture you, be? You you nailed it. It's a mixture. Uh, certain companies uh, include us in their tender, for instance. So right. when we're working for a contract. They have to demonstrate they have the capability of doing the entire contract, and we're sort of brought into it at that point in time. And at that point, it's sort of uh, we're hugging each other, and we all work to get the contract. In other cases, where if you get into the uh, the mineral side, it's it's most cases you're tendering now. Uh, in 2011, 2012, they were just happy to see you show up. Uh, now they're pretty tough on the negotiations. So it's really a function of which market you're talking about. The uh, the industrial one, we tend to do it through a contractor, a lead contract, you know, the big guys. And they provide the credibility and we provide the technical skill set. Yeah. What do you think, uh, uh, kind of two more questions that, that I'd like to ask is, what are you, moving forward, um, you've probably already touched on it, um, but... What do you think the big biggest challenge is, not, not just for, uh, for companies like Energold, um, but the mines that are trying to, to expand or start new mines? What do you think the biggest challenge for them is and Cap is going to be? Capital. Yeah. It's, um, the marketplace is uh, not paying attention to the industry at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're talking institutional, they tend to go for the equivalent to uh, IF you know, the exchange investment type situations. Uh, if you're talking retail, right now they're still chasing marijuana and cryptocurrencies. Right. And uh, for especially for the juniors, uh, miners, that's that's their, their basis. And uh, we're seeing one after another junior literally scraping to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's too bad because, uh, you know, we have in Canada one of the that's one of our leading industries. Our knowledge uh, in the uh, mining industry, uh, we have a highly qualified geotechnicians, geologists, engineers. That's what they do, and they do it very well. If that size of that activity shrinks too much, all of a sudden you've lost your leverage. You don't have that basis to call back on, and I think it's critical that that get maintained. I'm not sure how. I don't think. Really, that's a government type of thing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think they should probably stay out of our business as much as possible. But it really is where we have to make sure there's awareness out there. And it starts with the, the firms themselves, but it, it also s goes back to the brokerage community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I don't think the brokerage community is paying attention because there's not enough commissions for them to pay attention. And this recent thing of getting rid of the analysts mm -hmm. uh, is, is really detrimental to the industry. And, and in fact, people like yourself are critical to the industry, making people aware of what the industry does, what it can do, and the potential in the industry, and create more knowledge. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you, you know, um, this is a little uh, uh, aside. Um, there was an article the other day about the Trans Mountain Pipeline and saying, okay, it's going to be triple the number of uh, 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 amount of oil coming down the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And somebody in the same article said that means the 30 tankers a year are going to become 300. And I looked at that, and by the way, this is a reputable newspaper. I, I, I don't normally write newspapers, but I pointed out either they're shrinking the size of tankers or my mathematics is all wet, you know. <laughs> and, and that's what's happening is there's a lot of false information out there or incomplete information. And our yeah. job is to correct it and educate the marketplace. And I'm not sure we've done a good enough job yet doing yeah. that. And I think the one thing that we found is that people are interested. Um, there was a, we work on the marketing side for some supply companies. Um, and 
there's a, there's sort of a, been a trend that people only want sound bites. Yep. But the market, people will take what the market gives them. So people are being given sound bites, so that's what they take. Now with things like our, our show and other and other podcasts, people will sit there and li- watch these for three hours. People want information. They want to understand. They don't. The there there may be certain parties that are are pushing for sound bites because they don't want people to know. No. But if you give the, them the information, people will sit there. They they are going to sit there and listen to. I think our our average viewership on this people watch for twenty twenty five minutes an episode because they want the information and where are you going to get it. Um, the the last qu- uh, well, it's going to be a two part question I okay. have for you. <laughs> for you, sort of, what are your strengths? Because a lot of people watching this show, they're not going to be people that are necessarily uh, just in business or at the executive level. They're people that are, are trying to move up through the ranks or start their own business or, or, or things like that. So for you, what do you bring to the table that in, in a tough market has allowed your business to still grow? Um, and then the second part is what does Energol do as a company? Uh, to gain that reputation and to continue to grow. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, basically, A, I've got a lot of experience, and I, hopefully I don't relearn it too often. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, i got to admit, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an older guy, uh, but I'll tell you this, I'm always open to new ideas. Hmm. And I think too many of us are saying, this is what I've always done, this is what I should continue doing. And that's rubbish. I mean, things are changing dramatically. The environment we're working in is changing dramatically, and we have to be prepared to change. And uh, I think I'm very good at that. Uh, I think I try and motivate my team that way as well. And believe me, that's like pushing a rope, Uh, especially in the drilling industry, because the reaction is, well, we've always done that, Mm -hmm. or I've never done that, so why should I do it now? And I don't want to just say, do it because I told you to. Right. It won't happen. You've got to educate them to the point of this is how you can do it. This is what it means. So I do not a bad job of that. Uh, Not as well as I'd like, I guess, but not a bad job. I think when you get back then, that leads to the second side is Intergold itself. I mean, we were strictly mining. We were strictly uh, doing exploration. Quite frankly, about 90% of our competitors are in that market. Uh, And that's great. Uh, But right now, mining is definitely feeling the pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, our reaction is we still have more than enough rigs that if mining was to come back, we can generate that $120 million worth of mining. But I'm not going to sit here praying that it's going to come back tomorrow. And my attitude is we've got expertise, we've got the equipment, we've got the talent pool. Let's get out there and do drilling. I'm not going to try and be developing uh, games, et cetera, for for the uh, internet, but we have that expertise and let's use it. And uh, I think we're seeing that through the fact that the non-mining is growing way faster at the current moment than mining is. And uh, it tends to be a little more stable, which is kind of nice. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, going forward, I mean, I, I won't art, uh, put uh, any color to it other than the, the whole industry and in the mining in the drilling industry, especially right now is struggling. And uh, we've been going through the same struggles. And uh, I think, though, that that game that theory that we've, we've evolved into, our strategy, is valid. And uh, if mining was to stay down next year, um, I think with the growth we're seeing on the other sectors, we will continue to grow. And if mining picks up, then I'll be just a happy puppy as well, because that just means that much more. Right. But, yeah, we're, we're very flexible. Uh, I think we're very innovative, and uh, we're not afraid to take on challenges. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we co- we we cover. I think we hit most of the the talking points. Well, hopefully, we did. <laughs> 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 no, we appreciate you coming coming through. We're going to uh, we get we got a little bit of outro stuff, and then uh, then I'll come back and then talk to you off camera for a little bit if that's all right with you no problem at all yeah okay thanks a lot Fred. thank you i appreciate it yeah go ahead (laughs) i'll take those so they don't there you go all right thank you fred 
Okay, we're going to we're going to wrap up quickly. Um, well, we don't have to be that quick. We're not in that much of a rush, are we? Are you no, in a rush? No. You're always I'll so busy, I'm guys. Just relax. <laughs> <laughs> oh no worries. I'm I'm here for the next four hours. No, what is it? What time is it? What time is it? Oh, one oh, oh, it's one? two in the afternoon. No, it's one. Oh, one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one in the afternoon. Um. Wow, but that was um. That was a lot of in, uh, information, uh, a lot of things I, I didn't know. Um, and even just from reading what we did read uh, about drilling and the different types of drilling, yeah, he definitely got uh, a little more in-depth uh, with that. Do you, I don't know about you, but I find that every time we do the show and we cover it, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, we need about three or four episodes. Yeah. Like, because... It's just you not know, enough time. It's just not, yeah, like di- like diamond drilling you can t- or or the energy drilling sector or the, uh, I keep forgetting what it's called, which is HDD. really. HDD. The HDD, but what does that stand for? Horizontal drilling. Something. <laughs> um, f- when, when he's, we saw, I'm thinking. Oh, no, horizontal directional drilling. Directional drilling, that's the part they keep <laughs> messing up. Um. Yeah, and I just I, I I think in the future we we do need to start doing these parts and maybe not like consecutive episodes, but book people. You know, I, I mean, I'd love to get Fred back in here. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's we we you just scraped the surface, and we can't. I mean, our our podcast we're not planning on you know the Joe Rogan podcasts are sometimes they're three hours long. That's not really what we're planning to do. Um, they're of course like Fred, we got to be open to new ideas. Yeah. Um. But I just feel like there's so much to dig into, and and I'll be honest, I wouldn't get everybody back that we've had on. Um, some people are a little dry, or they're not engaged, or they they just they don't seem to be fully invested into into what we're doing. But I mean, Fred came in; he's got he has his answers, but he's 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 happy to go off script. I mean, I I touched I think about half the questions, or maybe a quarter, were the ones that were on script, and yeah. he just kind of went with everything. And and guys like that, if we uh, if we we come up with with specific shows, I think just to dig into that one, and I I think that's more what people want because like that feedback, I I think the guy's right. There is just a lot of the same information over and over and over, and people want the yeah. specifics. They've heard all of that before. Yeah, and exactly, a lot of the information is the same because we have such limited time. Yeah. That the introduction is always going to be that the same. Yeah. You know, and once we start hitting the more interesting and, and more the information that people want to hear, we start running out of time. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, we got to, uh, so that'll be our goal yeah. is to do series of, so bring in a company like Ener- yeah. Energold and a gentleman like Fred, maybe a couple of different people from the company exactly. to, d- to examine different areas of that. So that's a conversation I'm going to have with him. Um, let's go, I've mixed up my papers so much now, I don't know um we already went over the sponsorship yep. right uh we'll probably show that banner one more time in the bottom for cat so people know where to get the the discount oh yeah, absolutely get christmas presents for people especially if someone works outside get them boots trust me i've worked outside a new pair of boots is always welcome not just if you work outside if you like to hike mm, um, yep. or you like the outdoors they have great casual boots as well so or yeah just casual shoes yeah, if if you get a pair of cat boots and they're they're uh, they're not comfortable, let us know and I'll apologize directly to you on the air. <laughs> Guarantee you, I will not have to make an apology. Um, feedback: Where can people talk to us publicly, privately, if they want to become a sponsor on the show? Where well, is where can they go? You can email uh, info at crownsman dot com, or you know you could uh, private message Jared at Jared Downey. Or myself at Gaudi Molina too. Um, that's Instagram, Facebook. Are you Gaudi Twitter. Molina too on all those? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh well, you learn something new every day. Something new every day. <laughs> um, you can also follow us um, at Crownsman P. Also Facebook, Instagram, mm-hmm. uh, LinkedIn. Uh, continue to follow and subscribe on YouTube, uh, Crownsman Partners. Um, yeah, and visit our website. There's a lot of information on our website. You can always watch more videos there as well, mm-hmm. and that's crownsman.com forward slash podcast. Yeah, we have all the highlights. We have highlights and interviews yeah. and all that stuff. Exactly. Oh, and the Crownsman Podcast group. 
Yes. Uh, you can go with that on Facebook. That's that's and where that, a lot of the fun happens. And that's where you should um uh sorry, you should uh wow, what is the word I'm looking for? It's that kind of it's you the be, rain. Oh sorry, you should become a member <laughs> a member of the Crownsman Podcast group and For free. invite um as many people as you want mm-hmm. um because we post contests, um, events, you know, our show or live uh, moments coming up, yep. all of that goes on there. So you will be, you know, entering to win a we bunch g- of stuff. We gave away $600 <laughs> worth of boots yeah, on, just on one of our last right. live shows. Yeah. yeah. So please, please become a member, join yep. the group, invite as many people as you want. Um, become a sponsor for the show. For Talk to us, ask us questions. Yeah. And continue to send us feedback. We we love it. Yeah, it, it was better. it was lots of fun having this feedback. Um yeah. yeah. So thank you for watching the show. Uh, sign off with, with a simple thing just to, to let you know. We we call ourselves the voice of industry, but to clarify, we're actually just the stage. That's all that we're trying to be. We try to give you a platform, allow companies to come on, talk about their companies, talk about their employees, the work, the industry, the challenges. That's what our goal is. We're the stage, but ultimately, you and the companies are the voice of industry. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next show. Goodbye.